Yes, sir. Order. Let me apologize to my fellow senators. You know, I just had just gotten back from Iraq, Erbil, Uganda, Rwanda, uh, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Mauritania. Felt fine, but I hit the ground here, and I got non-contagious bronchitis. Got that? So anyway, that's why I'm much better today than it was yesterday. <laughs> much better, much better. The committee today received testimony on the posture of the Department of the Navy in the fiscal year 2021. We welcome our, 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 our guest today, um, the Acting Secretary of the Navy, uh, Tom Modley, uh, Admiral uh, Gilday, Chief of the Naval Operations, and David Berger, Commandant of the Navy. Thanks for coming. Thanks for your long term of service. We appreciate you very much. Uh, with the alarming speed of modernization of both conventional and nuclear forces, China and Russia present a credible threat. And uh, I always make reference to this because this, when we put this together, this was equal Democrats and Republicans as people who were, no one could question their capabilities. And, uh, and so we've been trying to follow this. So we, I'll make several references to this as well other members. And uh, we did the major thing there is that China and Russia has now pa have passed us in areas that we didn't want to be passed. I'm encouraged by some of our witnesses' public statements and guidance and their subordinates related to, uh, uh, to uh, reorienting and to great power competition. Thanks to President Trump's leadership, we reset defense spending in 2017, and we are beginning to rebuild the military after many years of neglect. But the hole is deep, and the work is just begun. I commend our witnesses for submitting a budget that continues to trend the, the funding and the readiness accounts uh, that support today's Navy and Marine Corps. However, it is clear to me that the Department of Navy's proposed budget only is only sufficient to support a fleet of about uh, 300 ships. That's clearly inadequate to the growing Navy to the uh, 355 as we find in the, in the manual I just uh, referred to. It's um, along these lines, I must also point out that the department has yet to submit a 30-year shipbuilding plan, which by law it was required to be submitted uh, to Congress with the budget last month. The absence of this plan makes it impossible to understand how the department plans to reach its goal and the national policy of a 355 ship Navy. We've got to be smart, not hasty, as the modernization, as we modernize our military, I urge each of you to take a long view. Recent history should be our guide because without better acquisition performance, we will fall behind or further behind, I should say, China and Russia. Uh, Senator Reid. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I join you in welcoming uh, Acting Secretary Modley and Admiral Gilday and General Berger to the committee this morning to testify of the plans and programs of the Department of the Navy in our review of the fiscal year 2021 authorization request. I particularly want to welcome each of you to your first posture hearing before the committee. We're grateful for your service, for the service of the men and women under your command, and for the support of all the Navy and Marine Corps families. So please express our thanks to these wonderful Americans. As the leaders of the Navy and the Marine Corps, you face significant challenges as you strive to balance the need to support ongoing operations and sustain readiness with the need to modernize and keep the technological edge so critical to military success. In addition, because significant levels of funding are being transferred to build a wall on the southern border, you will have fewer resources for modernization. The Department of the Navy faces serious readiness problems caused by deferred maintenance, reduced steaming and flying hours, and canceled training and deployments. Remember too well the collisions of the McCain and Fitzgerald and the loss of life that resulted. I will be interested in hearing about the progress the Navy is making in continuing to implement changes that will ensure such incidents will not happen again. All areas of our naval forces are maintaining an extremely high operations tempo. Demand is overwhelming for attack submarines, air and missile defense cruisers, destroyers, and strike fighter inventories. The Navy is now in its eighth year operating with fewer than the legally required 11 aircraft carriers. The Ford is listed in the Navy inventory, but that carrier is more than five years behind schedule and will not be ready to deploy for many, many months. 
In addition, during the next decade, the Navy will need to buy the new Columbia-class ballistic missile submarines to replace the Ohio-class submarines. This is an extremely expensive undertaking that is on a very tight schedule. The Navy is using authorities such as multi-year procurement authority to conduct modernization programs more efficiently. Congress has approved multi-year procurement authority for both attack submarines and Aegis destroyers. These vessels represent the largest inventory shortfall compared to the goals in the 2016 force structure assessment, with the actual Navy fleet 15 boats below the attack submarine goal and 14 destroyers below the goal for large service combatants. The Navy just recently signed the multi-year procurement contract for Block 5 of the Virginia-class attack submarine. This contract provides for buying nine boats the five-year period fiscal year 2019 through fiscal year 2023. The contract also provides an option to buy a tenth boat if the Navy has the resources and the contract has improved performance on the program. Yet the fiscal year 21 budget, which had the best opportunity for funding the tenth boat, did not exercise the option. I am concerned that the window of opportunity for buying a tenth boat could close if funds are not provided to the Navy this year to allow them that opportunity. I see that the number one item on the CNO's unfunded priority list is funding for the second Virginia class submarine in fiscal year 21. And I would obviously be interested in your thoughts on this issue. Modernizing ground vehicles remains a priority for the Marine Corps. The amphibious combat vehicle will provide increased force protection and enhanced lethality to our Marines, and it will replace the aging inventory of assault amphibious vehicles. The Marine Corps is also partnering with the Army to develop the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle, or JLTV, to replace the Humvee, and they have made target investments in the High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, HIMARS, in order to provide Marines with ground-based indirect fire support. I would welcome an update from our witnesses on how they are balancing the procurement of new systems while upgrading existing platforms to meet current operational needs. In 2016, Admiral Richardson released a force structure assessment that identified a new force structure goal. We had been promised a new force structure assessment by the end of 2019 that would address implementation of the national defense strategy, but that has not arrived. I also understand that the Department has not provided the 30-year shipbuilding plan as required by law. I look forward to hearing when the Department will deliver these important documents. Again, I want to thank the witnesses for appearing today, and I look forward to their testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Reid. We uh, will have opening statements. Uh, your entire statement will be made a part of the record. And we'll start with uh, Admiral Gilday. You're recognized. Chairman Inhofe, Ranking Member Reid, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today with Secretary Motley and General Berger. We are thankful for your enduring support of the Navy Marine Corps team. Today, three carrier strike groups and two amphibious ready groups along with 30% of our fleet, are deployed forward around the globe. Our Navy Marine Corps team needs no permission to operate at sea, and their power does not rest in any single location, but rather in our ability to maneuver anytime and anywhere the seas reach, operating across the spectrum of military operations. Without question, our sailors remain our most important asset. We have taken a hard look at what they need to be successful the equipment and the training that they need to fight and win, as well as support required to take care of them and their families. Over the past eight months, we have engaged in a deep examination of these issues. Our, our balanced approach and our budget submission this year provides a Navy ready to fight today while committing to the training and the maintenance and the modernization to, to provide a Navy that's ready to fight tomorrow. Naval power is critical to implementing the national defense strategy. But naval power is not just a function of fleet size. It is a combination of the readiness, the lethality, and the capacity of that fleet. Our number one priority remains the Columbia-class ballistic missile submarine. This request also heavily invests in our readiness accounts, such as ship and aircraft maintenance and modernization, in manpower, in live virtual constructive training, in steaming days and in flying hours. It invests in new systems to make our fleet more lethal, including increasing our weapons inventory, filling our magazines, bolstering the range and the speed of those weapons, exploring directed energy weapons, and incorporating new technologies like hypersonics. This request grows our fleet in size, 
generating sustainable, capable capacity. Importantly, naval power is not just determined by what we operate and fight with, but how we operate and fight. We are pursuing an integrated approach with the United States Marine Corps in fleet operations and exercises, in war games and in experimentation. The net result, we believe, is, an integ is integrated American naval power. I could not ask for a better partner, a better shipmate in this endeavor than General Berger. Thank you again for your support, which has allowed us to make significant gains in readiness and lethality already. It also allows us to answer our nation's call every day. On behalf of your active duty reserve and civilian sailors and their families who serve our nation, I thank you and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, uh, Admiral and Secretary Model. I probably should have started with you, but you're recognized now. Thanks, Senators. Chairman Inhofe, Ranking Member Reed, distinguished members of this committee, thank you for your bipartisan efforts on behalf of the sailors, Marines, and civilians of the Department of the Navy. It's an honor to be here today with Admiral Gilday and General Berger both of whom have demonstrated great commitment to each other and to each other's respective naval service as they have worked collaboratively over the last several months to lead our integrated American naval force. Consistent with that spirit, we've taken a different approach to the written testimony this year by submitting one unified document instead of three separate documents, which you've seen. Staying ahead in today's rapidly changing global strategic environment demands that our naval forces commit to unified planning clear-eyed assessments, and sometimes some very, very hard choices. In this process, we must harmonize competing priorities, sustain our critical industrial base, and not allow our maritime competitive advantage to erode relative to global competitors and, more accurately stated, aggressive adversaries who wish to hasten our decline as a global force for liberty and for decency. In the end, this budget submission is a manifestation of the hard choices we had to make this year but it's centrally about the safety, security, and well-being of our sailors, Marines, and their families. Ultimately, I ask that you recognize that in this submission, we could not make trades that put our sailors and Marines on platforms with equipment that are not ready for a fight, if a fight is what is going to be required of them. While this budget slows our tra trajectory to a force of 355 or more ships, it does not arrest that trajectory. You have my personal assurance that we are still deeply committed to building that larger, more capable, more distributed naval force within the strategically relevant time frame of no more than 10 years. I look forward to working with this committee and the entire Congress in the coming months as we develop some realistic plans to do that. Our budget also demonstrates a clear commitment to the education of our people as we implement the recommendations of the Education per Sea Power study that I led as the Undersecretary of the Navy for the last two years. We are establishing a Naval Community College for our enlisted personnel as part of a bold and unified naval education strategy that recognizes that the intellectual and ethical development of our people is critical to our success as a naval force. We are also stepping up our efforts to meet our solemn commitment to our military families through significantly more engaged oversight and accountability of our private, public-private venture housing program. Finally, I would like this committee to understand that as leaders of the Department of the Navy, we are both vocal and united in our determination to prevent sexual assault and sexual harassment throughout our force. Every sailor, Marine, and Navy civilian deserve individual respect, dignity, and protection from this great naval institution. We have some work to do in this regard, but you have my personal commitment that we take it very, very seriously. We are grateful to the Congress for passing this year's NDAA, which enables many of the priorities identified within this document. In passing this legislation, you sent a strong signal of support to our people and a very, very stern warning to our adversaries. We also appreciate the funding stability and the predictability of the last several years. This has saved money for the American taxpayer and given our force the agility and flexibility to address emerging threats while in investing in our integrated naval force. We urge the committee to do what it can to continue the stability so that we can implement the reforms and investments required to meet great power challenges, protect the maritime commons, and defend the United States of America. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, General Berger. Chairman Inhofe, Ranking Member Reed, distinguished members of this committee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify on the posture of your Marine Corps and our priorities for the future. And I'm joined by the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps behind me, Sergeant Major Black, 
my wife, Donna. And I'll start by echoing Secretary Modley and Admiral Gilday's thanks for timely funding, as well as your enduring commitment to the Marines, sailors, and families through efforts like the hurricane recovery, uh, which you authorized, provided for last year, and your revisions and oversight to our work on public-private venture housing program, which the Secretary mentioned. Your bipartisan support is critical to ensure that we continue to prioritize people as our greatest resource. Thanks to predictable funding over the last few years, the Marine Corps has made significant progress restoring both availability and readiness. We are now at an inflection point. We have to pivot now toward modernization while sustaining the readiness that this committee has worked hard to authorize and resource. This pivot, in my opinion, cannot wait until next year or the following. We must move now or risk overmatch by, in the future by an adversary, and that is a risk we will not take. As the National Defense directs and Secretary Modley recently emphasized in his first vector to all hands, we have to pursue urgent change at a significant scale. Marines have always sensed when it's time to move out smartly, we don't hesitate. This is that time. Realizing the bold direction of our strategic guidance requires acknowledging that there are fundamental changes in the operating environment and how we must organize, train, and equip the force. I'm confident that most leaders recognize that significant change are, is required, yet the scope and the pace of that change is seemingly at odds with some historical resource allocations and some of our major acquisition programs which predate the National Defense Strategy. This budget submission marks the beginning of a focused effort to better align resources with you provide with strategic objectives. Our future budget submissions will build on those investments with informed recommendations for force design, modifications, and adjustments to our programs of record. Together, in partnership with my battle buddy, Admiral Gilday, and under the direction of Secretary Modley, we are committed to delivering the integrated naval fleet marine forces your nation requires. As always, I welcome the opportunity to discuss our findings along the way. And we will keep each of you and your staffs informed as we progress. As always, we will be frugal with the resources we are given. We will ask for no more than we need. With Congress's commitment and support, we will ensure that your Marines continue to have every advantage when we send them in a harm's way. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, sir. Hey, uh, thank you. You know, I, I was going to start off with uh, talking about the fact that we don't have the 30-year shipbuilding plan. I'm sure somebody else would do that. There are two things that I wanted to get to, though, and one obviously is you uh, would not be unexpected, <clears throat> the USS Gerald Ford. I, I think most of us around in this table here have been down there, have, have walked it, uh, understand it, uh, but we're also fully aware that that ship, uh, the original plan to deliver the ship was September of 2015. It was to be, the ship was going to be delivered fully capable at the cost of $10.5 billion. Now the projected full delivery of the ship would be uh, April of 2021, the cost being at, uh, at uh, $13.2 billion. So, um, Secretary Modley, today's your lucky day. Uh, you get to make a next prediction, and uh, I'd like to have you kind of share with us where you think it is right now. It's my understanding that a lot of the things, it's not just the elevators, we talk about those, but we also the catapults, arresting gear, uh, the radar, uh, and I understand now that the non-skid situation is taken care of by, uh, from uh, visiting with you in my office. But kind of go over uh, where we are today what your predictions are and when this is gonna happen. Senator, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the Ford. I think the, uh, the history that you laid out about the Ford is, um, it's not a good history and it's one that uh, we should never allow to happen again. It's, uh, it's 
it's not the way that we should be uh, delivering ships uh, to the U.S. Navy. That being said, we are where we are with that ship, and uh, one of the first things I did is, uh, as the acting secretary was to basically put the fleet on notice that it's all hands on deck to make that ship ready for sea and ready for a fight if that's what we needed to do. So we've t taken several proactive steps over the last several months to get that ship ready. A lot of this work was going on already, but one of the main things we did is we moved the two-star admiral who's responsible for uh, the PEO for all carriers. We moved him to Norfolk to basically be there. It's symbolic, but it's more than symbolic. It requires a lot of attention uh, to detail on many of the things that were lacking on this ship. I've been down there twice since I've been the acting secretary, once as a surprise on my second day. Uh, just to see what it's like, and I didn't want any admirals there with me. I walked around, talked to the crew, got a good sense for where the ship was, and I also uh, rode the ship in after their last uh, last uh, short deployment where they went out and did uh, aircraft compatibility testing. Um, it has been night and day for me in terms of my perspective and my perception on what's happening with that ship. They've made substantial progress on the elevators. The elevators uh, that are working and certified, I think there, there are four of those, uh, they've done thousands and thousands of cycles with those with no problems. They launched uh, close to 1,000 aircraft and recovered them with no problems on the EMALs either. Uh, so significant progress. And the, 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 most, the most encouraging thing to me is walking around that ship is talking to the crew. The crew loves the ship. Uh, the way the crew, is, the, the way the crew uh, and how their jobs have changed, coming, several of them coming from Nimitz-class carrier to this carrier, it's completely changed the way they do so, their work. And, and I understand that. And I also talk to the crew, and it's, 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 those are their feelings exactly. I wanted to get one more thing in, sure. in my time here. In a recent interview, you stated, quote, I don't know if we're going to buy any more of the Ford class uh, after the uh, CVN 81, which would be the fourth one. We were certainly thinking about uh, the possibility of other classes. Can you elaborate on that statement? Yes, sir. I, I think it, we, we have a duty to look at what will come after the Ford. And the fact that we've made a two-carrier buy for the last two, it gives us some breathing room. It gives us a few years before we would have to award the next one, which would be in the 27, 28 time frame. Okay, that, that, that answers the question. Uh, uh, General Berger, on the, uh, the, uh, the CH-53K, which would be replacing the CH-53E. We're familiar with the cost of this thing and then some of the overruns, and I'd kind of like to get an update in this brief period of time from you as to where we are, why it's really necessary, and, and uh, uh, just give us your opinion on that. Thank you, sir. The, the requirement for a heavy lift helicopter remains valid. In fact, probably more valid in the and the adversaries, the competitors that we need to face and where you want your forward Marines, you, you have to have the ability to move that force around and its sustainment from ship to shore or shore to shore or back to ship again. So we have a valid requirement. A year ago, the 53K was in a different spot. We had both technical, as you know, engineering problems and cost problems. Today, much better place uh, engineering-wise technologically. It looks like a 53E on the outside, but like you know, you pop the hood, it's a completely different aircraft. The, everything from the exhaust uh, gas recirculation to the other 100 plus engineering challenges we have either solved or Sikorsky uh, has a solid path forward. So I'm very confident that the aircraft is on the right trajectory. Now it's a function of cost, as you pointed out, sir. And both procurement and the cost yeah, to operate that. Yeah, why does it cost more than a, an F-35? Pardon me, sir? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> uh, I, no, I was making a comment um, that it costs more than F-35. When you're talking to the general public, they don't know much about the air. They know about the F-35. Right. Go ahead. Yes, sir. So why does it cost more than an F-35? It's a, it's a brand-new fly-by-wire aircraft. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, Senator Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I indicated in my opening comments, the, the, the Navy is short, uh, critically short of attack submarines, 15 below the goal established previously and accepted by the Navy, and all 14 destroyers below uh, that uh, objective. And Admiral Gilday, is there any chance that this demand will lessen over time uh, or increase? 
Uh, Senator, given the pace of the Chinese right now, I don't think that that I don't think that that uh, that that threat's going to subside. I also think, uh, particularly in the undersea, is where we have we have an advantage, significant advantage, and so we want to maintain that overmatch. We don't want to take our foot off the pedal. No, I appreciate that. I think also too, with respect to Russia, uh, their sophistication undersea is uh, another challenge. It's not just simply numbers. It's also sophist more sophisticated vessels, is that correct? Yes, sir, much more sophisticated. And as, as you know, uh, the capabilities that we're putting in, uh, into the Virginia, Virginia class, the uh, Block 4s and the Block 5s, are significant. There's a significant leap forward uh, for the United States. And uh, so our intention is to continue to press with that technology and improve it. Now, in the Block 5i, there was a, a nine-ship commitment plus an optional ship. Uh, one of the concerns I have is that the, the window for this option will close very quickly and that this might be the best year to exercise the option. Um, can you comment on that? Because I, I, I see pressure not only in the construction of the, of the additional Block 5 vessels, but from all we've talked about here before, aircraft carriers, everything else, you know, destroyers. This might be the best year. Is that right? Yes, sir, I believe so. In terms of the workforce, I was just up in uh, Groton at Electric Boat a week or so ago, and uh, I, left, I left that, uh, that shipyard confident about the capability of that yard to produce boats at the rate of two a year. Uh, and, so, and they are planning for the significant increase of the work when, Colum when the Columbia bill begins in earnest. But uh, there, that, that is a passionate, well-trained workforce up there, and I think that they can handle two boats a year based on what I've seen. Thank you very much, Admiral. And uh, uh, Mr. Secretary uh, and um, Admiral Gilday, uh, the, the chairman alluded to this issue, but we're still awaiting these two significant reports, the force structure assessment and also the shipbuilding plan. Based on Secretary Esper's testimony yesterday, I believe it's at his desk, literally. And is that the re we're waiting for, for that, and when will we get it? Yes, sir. I'm, I'm very anxious to get over here and talk that through with the committee. Uh, Secretary Esper wanted a little more time to digest it. It's informed by the 21 budget, but also by the integrated force structure assessment that Admiral Gilday and General Berger put together. And I think he just wanted more time to understand it. Um, we, will, we will bring it over here as soon as uh, he, he feels that he's ready to do that. I think the, the committee encouraged him to, to take adequate time, but not a lot of time. So we, we hope that will be the case. Uh, General Berger, uh, you have uh, uh, a programs with the Army with respect to the JLTV, the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle. The Army is making some changes in the program. Are you adjusting to them, or how are you adjusting to them, I should ask? Senator, I'm aware of the adjustments that they're making. We have not made any changes yet to our procurement. And if we did, it would be based on, on the Marine Corps' needs. Uh, but we are absolutely tracking the changes, the, the adjustments that they're making. So far, sir, it's, I've seen it down in North Carolina where my son is. It's a phenomenal vehicle. I've had the chance uh, to look at it at the facility, and it is a very much more significantly, well, it's a good vehicle. I'll stop right there. Uh, Secretary Moley, uh, the committee in the last few years have created the National Sea-Based uh, sea Deterrence Fund because we understand the industrial base is significant, and there are problems with the industrial base for every type of platform. And uh, we think that by going th into the industrial base through, through the prime contractors, not only can we increase quality, protect from cyber intrusion, but also generate savings from doing the work right the first time. Can you just briefly comment? And I don't have much time. No, Senator, I agree. We, we, we've had some vulnerabilities in the supply chain uh, for across the, in, the entire Navy. Uh, it's a vulnerability that uh, our adversaries have figured out uh, that's easy for them to get in, and they can piece information together, and they get a, a bigger picture, even when a supplier may think that small piece of information is not relevant. So we are investing heavily in this. We are developing new strategies for how we do this, how perhaps we develop capabilities to perhaps create cloud areas for them that are secure, but it's a big concern of ours and we're addressing it. In addition to that, you just a simple fact of quality, uh, quality construction at the sub prevents rework at the prime. Absolutely. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Senator Wicker. Thank you very much. I appreciate the service of all three of you. I know you've had to deal with a, a budget number that you did you did not uh, arrive at yourselves, and I appreciate you, uh, you doing a difficult task. We hope we can uh, use our power of the purse here in this committee and in the Congress to help you out on that. Um, I, I think um, Ranking Member Reed uh, expressed uh, with regard to the 30-year shipbuilding plan, the sentiment of uh, most people on this committee that the secretary should uh, take enough time, but not too much time. So I want to sub I want to subscribe uh, my views to what he said about that. And Airman um, um, <laughs> Admiral Gilday, uh, with regard to the submarines, let let me make sure you said that that the threat will not diminish. Actually, the threat uh, is increasing, and that, it, and, and you nodded, but that is correct, right? Yes, sir, I agree. And that is not only with regard to the, speci the specific question, Admiral, that uh, Central Reed asked about submarines, but it's actually uh, across the entire fleet, is that correct? I would agree with that as well, sir. All right, thank you very, very much. And appreciate the fact that uh, the NDAA tasked uh, the Navy last year uh, to review alternative acquisition strategies. The Navy came back with a report that said significant savings could be achieved by procuring various combinations of amphibious ships. So let me ask um, you, Secretary Modley and General Berger, um, uh, about these findings, particularly as they're related to the three LPDs and the LHA-9, can you speak to the timeline for awarding the funding of these ships, and what are the benefits of procuring these four ships together? And let me just get all my questions out there, and we'll see what we can do in less than three minutes. Uh, what are the specific um, uh, capabilities and, and what is the specific importance, General Berger, of the amphibious ships that I mentioned? Sir, the amphibious ships capabilities wise in the past pretty conventional view of what they did in terms of the Navy, the force projecting the Marines ashore. And the way that we're going to need to operate in the future even more challenging and the role of the amphibious ship I think goes up. Why? Because in order to operate a force inside a contested area at the unclass level, inside there, you've got to have the mobility and you need the ability to sustain that force for a long period of time in austere conditions and move that force around. Amphibious ships are, people have told, told, uh, spoke of them as sort of the Swiss Army knife. They are. Because you can launch, you can move a force from the air, on the water. You got multiple means to do the job. So I think their value to the naval force, their value to the joint force goes up in the future. And with respect Secretary to the Mugler. business considerations, yes, right. Senator, we're looking at all types of options to be able to bundle <laughs> our buys of ships in order to drive down the cost, provide more stability to the industrial base and that supplier base, which extends far beyond just the shipyards that are doing the primary construction. So uh, I talked to Secretary Gertz about this this morning, about how we might be doing this, particularly in the AMFIB area, and we're going to be thinking about that and developing some plans to do that. Okay, and then specifically, the U.S. currently has four DDGs based in Rota, Spain. These platforms provide an advanced multi-mission defense capability. Uh, we are, I think we're, we're getting the right testimony with regard to, to uh, the need there. Uh, do, do we need the two additional DDGs in Rota, Spain, and, uh, and tell us uh, about the plans to accomplish that? Senator, uh, we support the two additional DDGs to Spain. Uh, right now, we're working with um, U.S. European Command. They are putting together their strategic laydown of the theater. So when that is complete, um, uh, you'll be briefed up here in the Congress. And then in parallel, we'll be moving through uh, the Office of the Secretary of the Navy and then the Office of the Secretary of Defense 
coordinating with the Department of State and then finally the government of Spain so they can line everything up uh, to get additional DDGs over in, at some point uh, to Rota. But we're very supportive right now. Um, our assessment is that the Spanish um, uh, want us uh, there in greater numbers, and certainly the commander of U.S. Uh, European Command does. And, and just briefly, General Walters has testified that we actually have the infrastructure there at Rota that is able, able at this point to house the two additional destroyers. Is that correct, Admiral? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you all for being here, for your service, and uh, thank you, General Berger, for your wife's presence here today. Donna's presence, I think, points to the importance of our military families and the service and sacrifice that they make so that we can be the greatest and strongest military force in the world. And in that connection, I'd just like to mention, I didn't have a chance to question uh, General uh, Milley or Secretary Esper yesterday about the Tenant Bill of Rights for military housing, which frankly is somewhat mystifying to me in failing to set forth three of the essential rights that we incorporated in the NDAA last year. And I want to emphasize again the importance of military housing and raising it to the standards that we think are important. I'm going to be submitting questions in writing to them. I don't want to take time on it this morning, but any responses in writing you have on that issue, I would certainly welcome. Uh, General Berger, I appreciated your response to uh, Senator Inhofe about the CH-53K. And uh, I agree with you totally on the importance of this aircraft. Uh, in fact, as you may know, uh, today literally marks the birthday of Connecticut Sikorsky Engineering, which was established in March 5, 1923. It's provided 97 years of capability for our nation's defense, including the CH-53K, which is a marvel of engineering. And I want to suggest that the cost of each aircraft would come down if the pace of production is increased. If we go from seven to nine, which I would advocate, uh, the cost per copy would come down. Would you agree with that point? I would agree with the math, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Admiral uh, Gilday, I want to Thank you for your visit to Groton, which was enormously meaningful and inspiring, and your very uh, insightful questions. And I agree with you completely that we have one of the great, passionate, dedicated workforces uh, in any engineering facility there at Groton. But I'm deeply concerned by the graph that you and I saw of the work, pay, work uh, worker demands, the production and employment capabilities that we're going to see and the troughs, the deep dips in employment, and particularly during 23 to 24, uh, 2023 to 24, uh, I would like to know what the Navy can do to mitigate those troughs. I know that time won't permit you to give a full answer, but I'm going to asked for a full briefing. I asked for the charts and some of the underlying data while we were there, and I wonder if you could respond to that point. Yes, I just say with the, with the lack of an additional submarine in uh, FY21, uh, what we would do and we are doing right now is to take a look with uh, Electric Boat at how we might be able to um, might be able to put some of their workforce that would otherwise potentially be furloughed to work, whether that be at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, in our facility up there or down in, down in Newport News, Virginia. And so uh, I, I will tell you this, that uh, we believe that the defense industrial base, particularly the work that's being done with ships and submarines, is absolutely the crown jewel in the defense industrial base. And so we want to work very closely to make sure that we don't hit a trough that we can't recover from quickly because that industry just is not very elastic. And so we've lived through this before, and we have to be uh, more responsive. Well, as you know, there's been a furlough of about 300 workers in the last few months. Sure. But that is minuscule compared to the thousands that we will see going down and then 
coming back in terms of the demands on that workforce. So the lack of that second submarine in 2021 is really going to be impactful. You're absolutely right. It is the crown jewel. Uh, and uh, I think we are really playing with fire if we fail to make sure that workforce is sustained. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. General Berger, I want to return to the chairman's question about the 53 kilo. Given its costs, can you just tell us in a little more detail what is the long-term outlook for this helicopter? Sir, so our program of record is uh, 200 aircraft. That's our requirement. And uh, the two costs, uh, as, you, as uh, most folks in here are really well aware of, are the APUC, the, in, the individual cost up front, and then the flyaway recurring costs. Uh, the math, as, as outlined accurately before, w when we get on schedule for a buy and the learning curve continues up, then the cost starts to come down. But we have to close that gap because I owe you uh, an honest answer that this is an aircraft that we can afford. This is an aircraft that we can sustain over the lifespan of it. So, uh, so far, again, the engineering part, I'm very, very comfortable with. Now it's a function of making sure, closing the gap uh, to where I can convince you that this is a good, this is the best use of our resources for an aircraft we definitely need. So you're saying that you owe us an answer and you need to convince us. It doesn't sound like you are yet fully convinced yourself. I think there's room still to close the gap and, and Sikorsky ag agrees as, as well. The, the learning that happens on the first of anything, of course, they're, they're going to drive down the cost just because they're going to produce it more efficiently. And the engineering costs that are going to the first batch of research and, and uh, engineering models is, is going to go down. When do you think we might well, I think get that yes, sir. answer? The next uh, contract is due to be awarded, I think, in the August, September time frame. We'll know then. Okay. I want to turn to another item that was in the President's budget request, um, which I found interesting. You are going to buy Tomahawk missiles this year. Specifically, I see the Marine Corps and FY19 asked for zero Tomahawk missiles. And in FY20, you asked for zero Tomahawk missiles. And in FY21, you have requested 48 Tomahawk missiles. I presume you're not planning to launch those off any of your amphibious ships. So could you tell us what you plan to do with those 48 Tomahawk missiles? Yes, sir. Part of the homework uh, that the Navy and Marine Corps have done over the past six months is how we think we're going to need to operate in the future as an integrated naval force. And that means the Marine Corps assumes a role which we have not had in the past 20 years, which is how do we contribute to sea control and sea denial? The Tomahawk missile is one of the tools that's going to allow us to do that. Now, it's a, much like the MQ-9 Reaper for us, it could be the answer, it could be the first step towards a longer term answer five, six, seven years from now. But what we need is long range precision fires for a small unit, a series of units that can from, from ship or from shore hold an adversary's naval force at risk. And that missile is going to help us, help us do that. And is it safe to say that this decision is a result of our withdrawal from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty that you can explore these options? Um, I, I would assume so. I hadn't linked the two together. We just knew we need a long-range precision fires beyond the range that we, could, that we were restricted to before, yes. And most particularly in the Western Pacific, given China's long-range precision fires, since they were never a party to the INF Treaty? Absolutely, yes. Okay. I'm glad to see that you are exploring those options. I'm sure you're, a lot of your Marines would think it would be awesome if you launched them from amphibious ships, but probably not what you have in mind. But obviously, we face a pretty significant firepower gap in the Western Pacific, given China's stockpiling of thousands of missiles. And it's good to see your service beginning to address that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, in a hearing like this, you always get uh, comments and questions about things that are left out. I want to start with a compliment, the fact that you've increased the R&D budget, uh, because uh, we're in a not only a, 
a, a competition of, of forces and ships and troops, but a competition of innovation. And uh, if we're going to stay ahead uh, in terms of the technology of, of future conflicts, uh, R&D is going to be critical. Directed energy, I think, is an enormously important potential part of our uh, naval force. Um, uh, hypersonics we've discussed, and, and I think that's something we're going to be discussing, or I'm going to be talking with uh, Admiral with you and your staff on a, in a classified setting. Unmanned craft, I mean, there's, there's a, just a lot of new uh, technology that we, has to be uh, developed over the next several years, and I, I compliment the, the Secretary and the, and the Department for putting some emphasis on uh, R&D and, and innovation. Uh, now, for the other side of the coin, uh, I'm concerned that uh, we're talking about trying to get to a 350-ship Navy, or actually, Mr. Secretary, I think you've talked about a 390-ship Navy. Uh, and we're also talking about developing a new large surface combatant, and yet in the fit up, in the new fit-up, we're losing four destroyers, which are sort of the workhorse of the, of the surface combatants. Uh, and I'm worried about a gap. I'm worried about a fall-off in not only in, in shipbuilding, but in the industrial base. Can you speak to that concern? Senator, thanks for the question. I think one of the problems we have this year is we have sort of a con confluence of bad timing on a lot of different things. We, we, worked, we started on this integrated force structure assessment last summer. Uh, it was delivered to me in January, and it sort of came to me after we had already completed most of the work on the 21 budget submission. So um, what we found in this, this force structure assessment is that there's a demand for a 355-plus type of scenario. Uh, and part of that 355 are large surface combatants. Yes, they are. Like DDGs. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. They're, they're, uh, most of everything that we have right now is going to be part of it, but there are new things that uh, Admiral, uh, sorry, that uh, General Berger alluded to, a new smaller amphib, new smaller uh, uh, combat support vessel that can help support distributed maritime operations. Of course, the new frigate will be a key element of that strategy and in that new force structure. And then unmanned platforms, both under sea and uh, above, uh, above the surface, or on the surface, will be part of that future force mix. We're just in the process of trying to uh, educate and help the secretary understand what this might mean, uh, and then we will move out with the strategy for how we get there. Um, that is, that's a challenge for us. But in any, in any scenario, we're talking about a significant expansion in the size of the fleet. And we're looking at a flat top line, and those two, th that mathematical equation is difficult for us to bridge. Well, one of the problems is that we're trying to recapitalize through operating budgets. Uh, any other business in the world would say a 40-year asset like a Columbia-class submarine is a capital in investment uh, as opposed to a, a drain on current operating cash flow. And yet, that it's the bulge in the in the process of the modernization and the rebuilding of the nuclear deterrent that's that's really causing a lot of this squeeze. As I I see, Admiral, do you agree with that assessment? Yes, sir, I do. Uh, the secretary has challenged us with uh, finding eight billion dollars this year in our existing budget so that we can put that towards uh, not only ship shipbuilding but all the other pillars that support it: the manpower, the weapons, the training, et cetera. So that we uh, so that we can increase our so we can increase our numbers, with respect to the legacy ships that we that we're that we're looking at decommissioning, it becomes uh, we get to a point, sir, where the return on investment we're just not not going to get the return with respect to lethality, and so some of these uh, hulls are over 30 years old, and so it's numbers are important, but you know in the end we'd rather have a ready capable lethal fleet of course. over a large lethality is the measure not absolute numbers i understand that Correct. by the way if you're yeah. talking about decommissioning ships give them a few more years and send them to the caribbean and the and the pacific where we can interdict some of these drug shipments we've got we are now interdicting 25% of the drug shipments we know of we know of and 75% are going by even though we know they're there because of a lack of of assets so if you got spare ships, Admiral, I know where you might want to send them. Uh, sir, we are sending uh, ships to Southern Command and uh, in discussions right now about what those numbers ought to look like. Um, uh, in fact, we're deploying two littoral combat ships this year. Because that's a war we're in right now, and Americans are dying in that war. Yes, sir. And I sincerely hope you and Southcom and Coast Guard can, can really get together and, 
and uh, make a dent in that traffic. I don't have, I'm out of time, General, but perhaps for the record, you could give me your thinking on the, the reduction of, the, of your end strength by 2,100 Marines, uh, given the demands on the, on the Marine Corps. So I'll, I'll, I'll look for that for you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for your service. General Berger, there have been reports that the Secretary of Defense will move the Close Combat Lethality Task Force from an element that directly reports to him to one that reports to the Army. This is an organization that is examining the full range of capabilities from material solutions to physiological performance to improving policies in order to provide the overmatch to the 4% of the members of the Joint Force who have experienced 90% of our combat deaths since the end of the Second World War. This is obviously a joint problem, one that the Army, Special Forces, or Special Operations Command, and the Marines need to have full visibility on, and where solutions need to be joint and department-wide. Can you provide me with your best professional military advice on what about this move could work, and what about this might not work for the Marine Corps? Sir, I'm very familiar with it. Uh, when, it was or, when it was initially stood up, it, it, and since uh, it was run by, uh, by a retired Marine colonel who I know really well from Fallujah, Iraq. So for the Marine Corps, we have been involved in the task force from day one, and still are. So the move to shift it into the Army, uh, I'm not concerned about. We work laterally on a lot of programs like the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle. It's not an issue at all. But parking it in a service is a good thing because they're, they know how to run a program, they know how to resource it, and there's great working relationships between services already. We're, we, are, we remain tied in on that task force. We have Marines as part of that task force within the Army now. That'll continue. For all the reasons that you said, that's where the casualties occur. Thank you, General. Uh, today, in, in, in the way that we fight our wars, the electromagnetic spectrum is essential in terms of how we do battle. Uh, and, and we use multiple parts of the spectrum. Um, specifically, and I want to refer to uh, the Secretary's uh, Hask testimony on February 26th. Secretary Esper said that the DOD is willing to share, and I emphasize share spectrum, with 5G networks in the mid-band range of 3 to 4.2 gigahertz. Um, Secretary Modley, what systems does the Navy have that might be affected, and how could sharing that spectrum uh, space impact homeland defense? And I'd like to specifically point out we're talking about sharing and not vacating that space. Well, it would, Senator, it would have a profound impact on our Aegis system, uh, and of course, we, we cannot abandon that spectrum. It would have profound negative implications for, for that system. So uh, as the Secretary stated, we're willing to share it, but we, we have to be very protective of that because it is critical to our ability to defend ourselves as a nation. Thank you. Admiral Gilday? Sir, I have nothing more to add to the Secretary's comments. I completely agree that we need to protect that portion of the spectrum. Uh, for ages for Homeland Defense. Thank you. Let me go, go back a little bit on, on, and talk about submarines. Sure. Uh, we've talked about building new submarines. Uh, I'd like an update, if I could get it, uh, with regard to the uh, mid-year refueling or the mid-life refueling on the submarines, the uh, nuclear attack submarines that we have right now. I'm going to point out, and I've done this in the past, that we're talking about the USS Boise. And now I understand there are three more that are waiting at dock to be able to sequence into dry dock to be actually refueled and made available for service again. The need, I believe, is still there, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but with these particular submarines, we still want them. This could mean that the USS Boise may very well have been out of service for a period of eight years waiting for refueling before it's back in operation again. Can you tell me uh, what we're doing to expedite the process to bring these, these submarines back on and where we're at in that process? So we're going to begin maintenance on Boise this May, and then we'll get under contract for her uh, for her extended uh, for extended maintenance. At the time that these decisions were made on Boise, we had a capacity issue in our uh, in our public yards, and so we started to uh, then send some of that work uh, to our to private yards. 
We're now at the point, and I know you're aware of this, in the public yards, we've increased that workforce by 10,000 workers in the past 10 years. And so 4,000 in the last uh, three years, I think. And so we have that capacity back. We're actually taking one of our availabilities from a private yard and now moving it back into the public yard. I don't want to imply that we're out of the woods yet and we're watching it very closely. I think we're in a better place now than we were two and three years ago. We'll be able to, if, if I could say, we won't have the same problem with the next three in line that we had with the Boise? Don't anticipate it, sir, but I will, I will go back and take a look, and we will brief you in more detail on what that lineup looks like and any challenges that we think we may face. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to thank you for visiting Hawaii, and I especially would like to thank your wife for the time that she spent with the family of, of the, uh, the people who were shot at the shipyard and also the survivor. Please extend my thanks to her. Over the past uh, few weeks, I have met with several of your colleagues, including Assistant Secretary Gertz, in fact, that was only two days ago, I think, or yesterday, to discuss the importance of modernizing our shipyards. And of course, the delay in, in repair and all of that was just uh, touched upon by Admiral. So I can't overemphasize the importance of uh, us continuing to uh, go through with the ship uh, the, with the uh, modernization plan. And just to let everybody know, the, Port, the Pearl Harbor Shipyard, which is one of the th four public shipyards in our country, and Pearl Harbor contributes nearly one billion to Hawaii's economy every year and employs close to 6,500 personnel, including nearly 1,000 engineers. It is the largest uh, employer of its kind in Hawaii. But, and due to the current inefficient arra arrangement at the shipyard, it is necessary that the optimization plan be implemented to provide much needed updates. And so you, I know you are ve very well aware we need a new dry dock and a production facility. Funding the critical uh, shipyard modernization program will require a significant portion of the Navy's budget. Does the Navy's fiscal year 2021 budget fully fund the shipyard modernization plan so that it will be implemented on over time, on time, and I'm talking about the, the four shipyards, not just the one in Hawaii. Yes, Senator, I, we, th this is a high priority for us in the Navy, and we, it is a 20-year commitment of $23 billion, I believe, over 20, uh, over 20 years. So mm -hmm. as long as we're here, we'll continue to push for this. We're sequen sequencing in the work in, a, in the most logical possible way that we can to address the things that you mentioned, which is how the, how the, work flows through the shipyard. So we ensure that we don't do work now that then we're going to have to take out as part of the longer term strategy. So yes, it's funded. I believe we're spending almost uh, $600 million on this this year, uh, and that will continue. Is $600 million enough to uh, keep to the, to the timelines that we have for the modernization program? I believe it is. I, I believe it is. I think when we looked at this and we thought about the work and how we would uh, push it through the four different yards, it made sense to do it in this way. Obviously, we'd love to have more to be able to do more, but we also had to think about how we don't disrupt the current work that's in there at the same time. And of course, in Hawaii, I'd like to see some concrete actually being poured for the uh, dry dock and the production facility sometime soon. Uh, in, uh, Mr. Secretary, in conversations that I've had with subcontractors uh, that support our shipbuilding programs, I've heard that the guidance associated with the Cybersecurity Maturity Modernization Certification, CMMC, has been somewhat confusing, making it difficult for businesses and contractors to comply. And what can you tell me about the current state of the CMMC framework? And I'm told by the subs that you know the, the, there are changing requirements that come down the pike, and they they do their best to try and comply. But um, with regard to the new one, which is the CMMC, uh, what timelines are in place for educating, certifying? and auditing our defense industrial base, keeping in mind that there are thousands of uh, suppliers and I assume that all of them need to provide certification regarding the, the security requirements. Yes, Senator, that's a great question. Um, to get, if you allow me to get you specifics on where we are in the implementation to that, I will do that. We've elevated our cyber security awareness to the highest levels in the department with a new office there. I'm sure they're monitoring this, and I can get you specific details. We understand there's pushback from the supplier base, particularly the smaller mm -hmm. subs who see this as an additional cost for them, and we're trying to figure out ways that we can help them 
perhaps create some shared services for them that they could use at that level. But let me get you a specific answer. I think that's really important because we, we have literally, as I said, thousands and thousands of suppliers. And, and you know, there's always that weak link possibility if we don't um, provide them with the kind of uh, support they need to comply. Uh, last week, Admiral Aquilino, he's the commander of PAC Fleet, issued guidance instructing Navy vessels departing from port visits to remain at sea for at least 14 days before pulling into another port in order to monitor sailors for uh, coronavirus symptoms. And this week, the Sixth Fleet followed suit. How is the Navy preparing for a, um, coronavirus, and how, uh, how do you anticipate that the virus will impact the Navy's ability to operate overseas? Admiral? Yeah. Uh, Senator, we're following the department's guidance, which essentially tries to minimize contact, particularly in those areas where you know there's a heavy concentration of corona, uh, coronavirus, and it manifests in different ways in different geographic locations. Mm -hmm. We're receiving excellent reporting from the uh, World uh, Health Organization through to CDC and down to the department on specific areas. Italy and Bahrain are really good examples. Uh, the Korean Peninsula is another good example. And so we're, we're trying to be... Uh, preemptive and, and, and preventative in terms of limiting numbers of large gatherings, as an example. Mm -hmm. um, ba on a day-to-day -day basis, we're making decisions on closing DOD schools uh, based on what we're seeing in terms of uh, caseloads at local hospitals. All of our medical personnel have been trained in the symptoms, and if they suspect that somebody does have uh, uh, corona, uh, we, we test for it, and then we send that off to a lab to be confirmed. But uh, we also quarantine those people and their, and, and their families until we ascertain whether or not they're actually infected. Do you have test kits? No, we don't. We don't yet, but that's not just a problem for DOD. But um, I, think that, I, I think that we're getting to a better place in terms of uh, the production to allow us to be able to distribute those out to the, out to the force. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence and in, uh, allowing me to go over, and I do have some other questions for the record. Thank you. Thanks for Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, very much for being here today. And, Secretary, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, many businesses across America depend on predictable shipbuilding uh, requirements to maintain a trained workforce and develop manufacturing lines. And you are probably not surprised to learn that in Iowa we do not build ships. Um, we do not. But my landlocked home state of Iowa is part of the Navy's inventory and uh, pipeline of talent. And Carver Pump, which I love to highlight, Carver Pump and its team of 110 hardworking Iowans supply pumps to almost every Navy ship in the active fleet, and they are being installed in many ships currently in production. And in total, Iowa is home to eight submarine industrial base suppliers. So we are very proud of that. While we're not uh, providing the, the end product, the finished ship, um, we do have those suppliers. And so I do understand that the Navy must utilize its funds and invest in assets that reflect the NDS of today, uh, the goals to modernize our fleet. Uh, how are those conversations going with industry to ensure that their production capabilities can meet the requirements in this new era of great power competition? Well, we have an amazing supplier base in the country, but it is under pressure uh, to mm -hmm. some extent. And, and so we have to ensure that we're maintaining a steady flow of work through them. The, the, the carrier program alone, if you look at the, the uh, Ford program right now, employs over almost 60,000 people across the United States in 46 different states. And so when you think about a program like that, and not just the employment, but the type of employment, this is all high technology. We're bringing in workers, young people, training them in a trade that they can continue to contribute to this process over time. And so we have to be really, really careful when we talk about decisions in this space because it, it is that national asset that they create is the ship that we see. But the national asset they contribute to is the national asset of manufacturing capability mm -hmm. and high technology that exists in the country that follows them. So we have to continue to worry about that and think about it. When I go out and speak to industry, um, I, what I find more often is that I find businesses that are not currently doing defense work that are really interested in doing defense work. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. how do we make it easier for them to do that? And so we're working on that. 
Right, absolutely. And I, I do appreciate that. And we I, we look at examples like the Ford. We get very concerned about that because as, um, as members of Congress, we are watching those taxpayer dollars. So we are reliant on industry as well to make the recommendations to make sure we're producing uh, the necessary requirements for our fleet, but get it out in a timely manner and on time, on target is always best. But... Um, Always having those discussions with industry is important, so thank you for that. Um, we're all familiar as well, um, Mr. Secretary, with this committee's concern for the health and well-being of all of our service members. And last year, when Congress passed the NDAA for uh, fiscal year 20, we included a provision that directed the Department of Defense to document blast expo exposure history in the medical record of all service members. And we've made significant improvements in this area on how we are treating, documenting, and understanding the effects and causes of traumatic brain injuries. Um, the progress is encouraging. Uh, we still have more that we can do and where we can potentially um, uh, negate the impact of TBIs. And can you maybe explain to this committee uh, what the Department of the Navy and the Marine Corps is doing to improve the understanding and prevention of traumatic brain injuries and specifically those um, coming from blast injuries? Yeah, ma'am, I can say okay, that thank the... Uh, you. About 80% um, of the TBI injuries that we see are, are off-duty related. And uh, we, be, because of, uh, we benefited, uh, military medicine has benefited greatly from what, we, what we've experienced from Iraq and Afghanistan. So we're able to return about 85% of those, uh, those sailors back, uh, back to work just based on, based on the, uh, the high uh, proficiency of our medical teams. Very good. I know that in, in SOF, uh, we are, are actively baselining um, many of their members, and, which is something that we would love to do across the conventional forces as well. General Berger, would you like to address it, please? Just uh, three quick parts to that. First, the protect part, the equipment that we wear, the vehicles, the aircraft. Uh, a lot of improvement over the last three or four years. We have a lot of room still to go there. Second is uh, the detection part, which you mentioned, really difficult, mm -hmm. uh, which relies wholly on baseline up front, which we do as well. All of us who've been to Iraq and Afghanistan in the last six, seven years, all baseline. We did not do that. The first deployment, I was mm -hmm. not either. Have to do that because you can't measure any, mm -hmm. any change from that. And the last part is the treatment, which the, which the CNO mentioned. And it can't stop initially. This is an enduring... Uh, the imp impact of that could, could be lifelong. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's different than some other ailments, some other uh, issues that we have. We have to treat it as a long-term issue. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and General Berger, you're spot on. It, it does create complications uh, further down the road, if we, especially if we're not treating that TBI. So thank you, gentlemen, very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for uh, being here today and for your service. Uh, Secretary Modley, I want to ask you about the frigate. You mentioned the frigate as a key element in our um, future ship um, fleets. Can you give us an idea? I've got folks down at Austell down in Alabama trying to put together a great design and compete for that contract, but it seems that the process timeline's been a little bit of a moving target. Can you tell us right now where we are in that process and the timeline for the frigate contract award? Senator, th thanks for the question. We, we are, the plan had been to award the, sh the uh, contract sometime in the latter half of this fiscal year. Um, I've asked Secretary Gertz to look at possibly pulling that forward if everything's done properly and everything is thoroughly uh, vetted and evaluated. And so he's looking into that. So there is some possibility that we may pull that uh, award a little bit sooner. All right. Could you let me know if that is, is the case? Yes, sir. Um, I noticed in the uh, FIDAP that it includes only nine frigates, uh, although originally there were going to be ten in the first block. Does this mean that the total ship procurement is being reduced or uh, just the procurement timeline? No, sir. I think that this, this is part of the uh, discussion that we had that we've been talking about earlier about the new integrated force structure assessment and how the frigate plays in that. Based on current plans and current thinking, this is where we are. But I anticipate as we look at this in more depth and the Secretary of Defense can get comfortable with it, we're going to look at 
ways to possibly purchase more of these over time. Um, but right now, that's sort of where we are in terms of our thinking. Okay, so we, the, the total numbers haven't changed just in this first block. Is that a fair no, statement? Yeah, no, no, sir, nothing's changed in that. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, sticking with Austin for a minute, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the expeditionary fast transport, the EPF. Uh, can you give me an idea, Admiral Gilday, where those are being uh, used and how they're being used right now, the EPFs? So uh, those ships are great. They, they've got, we put adaptive force packages on them, and so uh, some of them are highly classified missions. Um, others are to, to move troops or to, uh, to, to uh, we just used two in an exercise called Pacific Partnership um, in uh, Indo-Pacific where we use them for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And, and the two that we have in the budget, um, what we're trying to do with those ships is to give them a medical capability where they actually have a 750 ship, uh, 750 room uh, hospital as well as 12 operating rooms. And so because of the, the cubic footed, foot uh, space that you have in those ships, you can really do a lot with them, including uh, their flight deck. All right, well, I, I'm asking because um, you've got two in, in, in this budget, but the president just took away one. <coughs> Um, that was set to be awarded, I think, in April uh, of this year as a $260 million contract again for, uh, if, and if, I'm curious as to if that particular ship could have been used the same way, why was it taken out? Sir, I can't tell you directly why it was taken out. I know that, uh, I know that those decisions were made at a, at a higher level based on priorities, that uh, strategic priorities. Um, and so I, I just don't have the direct answer for you on the why. All right. I may send, submit a question because I, I, Secretary es Esper's answer was just not satisfactory yesterday, especially in light of, of your testimony today. And I, I want to emphasize again, I just think taking the funds away from our sailors, soldiers, and airmen is just wrong. Um, it hurts our men and women in, the, in uniform. Uh, and, it, and it, quite frankly, hurts my community in Mobile where we're taking away that because we've got a lot of folks down there that are dependent on Austell uh, and the ships that they build. Um, Secretary Model, let me just ask you real quick. Uh, when you talk about, you mentioned last week, I want to just talk about the uh, 355 main ships may no longer be the right number for our force. Uh, and you mentioned that it could be as high as 390. Can you kind of give me some ideas of where all this is coming from and, and how you're making those assessments and what you're looking for? Well, sir, it's, it's strategy-based. It's based on the threat, uh, what we see the threat uh, that's emerging, how we would want to counter that threat, not just in terms of a warfighting scenario, but in terms of deterrence and presence. And so that's, where, that's what's driving it. Uh, what's driving the change of the numbers is some of the things that I mentioned earlier in terms of the, the requirement for a new smaller amphib, uh, a new combat support vessel as well, possibly more frigates, as you mentioned uh, earlier. That's where sort of the numbers are elevating uh, when we start looking at the difference between this and the 2016 assessment. All right, are we going to be able to see that 30-year shipbuilding plan and force structure assessment pretty soon? Yeah, I, I hope so, sir. I'm, All right. I, I've, I've seen it. I just need to make sure the Secretary of Defense is comfortable with it. Well, I would encourage you to try to get that to us as soon as possible, sure. please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, these uh, concerns about the, and, the, and the wringing of the, of the hands about this budget would be have a whole lot more credibility if we'd heard that when the three times in the last 50 years we had three presidents in the late 70s and the mid-90s and uh, just recently cut our military spending by 25 percent. That's what this is about today. We're trying to recover. You've done a marvelous job in the Navy and the Marines getting our readiness back. I want to commend you guys for that. Today I want to talk about shipbuilding. When we get this budget, we're supposed to get a shipbuilding plan. Uh, Secretary Modley, when, when will we, should we expect that? Sir, I'm hoping to get it over here as soon as possible, but frankly, it's not my call. I'm waiting for the Secretary of Defense to allow us to, I understand. to bring it over. Um, Admiral Kilby this week, yesterday as a matter of fact, did a great job explaining his requirements, Admiral. Um, he talked about four priorities, Columbia class, readiness recovery, lethality, and capabilities we can afford. I respect that. Um, the question, and I want to highlight um, the, the NDS, the 355 ship number was developed in 2016. Prior to the NDS, is the 355 number consistent with the NDS requirements put on Navy and uh, Marines? It's low, sir. So. 
Uh, so An honest yeah. man. Thank you, so, sir. The short answer. So since the time that that assessment has yes, been sir. done, and if you consider the fact that we're integrating much more closely with the Marine Corps and within the Joint Force, you have to consider not only uh, what we're going to fight with, the capabilities, but also how we're going to fight. And so that's translated against a threat that has increasing capability into a larger number of ships, a larger number, larger number of more capable lethal ships. So it has to do with several things, right? What's your responsibility against emerging threats? You said that. What's sure. the, how are you going to fight the force? Sure. And then what kind of lethality do you have? So sure. you're working on now that we're not hamstrung by INF. We know that China has out, they outstick us today. Is that fair? In some areas, sir, okay. yes. Secondly, they have about 350 boats today to our 296, by my math. I think that's correct, directionally. Yes, sir. If you look at what they've said publicly, by 2030, they'll have 425. And if that, ex that same uh, uh, gradient goes out by 2034, which is our planning period behind the current uh, shipbuilding plan, we would be at 355 by 2034. That's the 2016 plan. That may change in the current shipbuilding uh, plan, that I understand. But by my that we have an 80-boat shortage right now, and we have responsibilities in multiple AORs. They pretty much have one. Are you concerned that uh, our shipbuilding plan is not going to be able to do what we need to do over that 15-year period, particularly against the buildup that we see China? They've deployed more boats in the last 30 months than they have in the last 30 years. So we see their activity. They're telling us what they're doing. Yes, sir. So... Uh, simply, it really comes down to our top line, right? And that, that's our biggest constraint in terms of growing a bigger Navy. Since I've been in uniform, the size of the United States Navy has been dwindling. Over the last few years, we've come up, uh, we've come up uh, in numbers a bit, but not a lot. And so uh, we believe, based on the NDS and for all the reasons we just stated, that it's time to reinvest in, in the naval force. Well, it, and it'd be one thing if we could fund it. What I'm worried about, and let's take submarines, for example. Your number one priority is Columbia class. Uh, I'm proud that Georgia hosts one of the two nuclear bases that, uh, that hosts those. But we've lost from, in the last decade, 17,000 vendors, uh, submarine vendors, down to 3,000 vendors. Even if we were to push the money toward this goal to get to where we need to be, can we rebuild the supply chain fast enough to accommodate that? Sir, uh, based on what we know, we think we can. Based on uh, what we, we're projecting in terms of submarines, as an example, in terms of what we're procuring, that that, 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 that vendor infrastructure is in place to support that. Can I move on to one other thing? Uh, the Air Force is developing ABMS right now, and that looks like they've had one demonstration across the services. I think there's another one coming up in April. How involved is the Navy in looking at this from the service needs as well as the data that the Navy will be creating? Obviously, as I understand this, this is a very classified development. Um, can you give us an update about the Navy's involvement, the Marines' involvement on that? Sir, so the, the problem set is that we have netted weapons and we have netted platforms and netted C2 nodes, but we don't have a net, right? And so uh, all the services have come together under a concept called joint uh, all-domain C2, so, and we're putting heat on it, a Manhattan Project-like effort, so that we're not delivering this in the mid-2030s, but in, in the 2020s. All the Joint Chiefs are flying out, uh, flying out to Nellis uh, on, on, in early April to take a look at this together to make sure we understand how we're going to get after it. It's a priority. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Secretary Modley and Admiral Gilday, I am um, quite encouraged to see the priority that the Navy continues to place on hypersonic weapons. Um, as you know, Sandia National Lab has played a critical role in developing this technology over a number of years now. How would you characterize the combined Navy and inter-service effort to transition hypersonic glide bodies out of the labs? Well, thank you for that question. I actually was in Sandia a few months ago and got to see what they're doing out there, and it's really amazing, amazing work. And I'm actually very encouraged about the fact that we're working together with the Air Force and the Army on this because it is an expensive uh, proposition, and uh, we need to pool our resources and our brain power to get after it. So I think that the, pro the, the progress is good. Uh, we significantly asked for uh, a significant step up in funding this year mm -hmm. in order to do this. Uh, as I look at the test schedule, uh, it looks, it looks uh, aggressive, but I think it's doable. So um, 
that's probably all that I can talk about in, in an open in this forum. Environment. We'd be more than happy to, to come over and have our team brief you on how we're doing on that. that Would there be value in co-locating the development and the production of those capabilities so that we could fully leverage synergies, expertise, and, and frankly shorten the feedback loop in that transition from development to production? Well, I think anything that we can do that can accelerate the process of getting these fielded would be would be important. I think one of the biggest challenges we have right now is the, it's not the technology and how to develop these missiles, but it's the production. How do we get this into scale mm -hmm. over time? And, and that is a challenge because we don't have an industrial base that can really do that right now. So we're looking at ways that we can help accelerate that through some incentives, et cetera, to, to, uh, to put some funding out there so that we can accelerate the the creation of the industrial capacity to produce at scale. Well, I hope you'll consider us a partner in that effort. Uh, I want to switch gears now to um, the uh, uh, the Navy has been conducting live fire tests of its experimental electromagnetic railgun uh, at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico over the past year. But the FY21 budget includes pretty minimal funding for this capability. What's the Navy's plan to continue developing this program and, for that matter, to mount it on a ship for at-sea testing as well? Admiral. Yes, sir. Uh, so the testing, is going, the testing is going rather well. What I'd like to do, sir, is come back to you in a classified setting and talk to you in more detail about where we are with that and where we want to go. Okay. Do you, um, can you, in this setting, can you comment on the, um, the resourcing in this particular budget? Sir, the, the resourcing right now we think is adequate based on the amount of effort that we have that we have ongoing. Okay. So we saw uh, we saw more money in the budget last year based on what we needed what we need to do in terms of uh, in terms of R and D. But we're more more of a steady state at the moment. Okay, going to the twenty one. Let's um, let's talk Columbia class for a, for a moment. I, I think this committee understands the importance of that modernization to the nuclear triad. Um, what what are your contingency plans if the Navy does not make the already very tight timeline uh, for Columbia, and where would you accept risk? Sir, that would be best handled in a classified setting. I will say that we've had those discussions with the Secretary of Defense, and you can't just consider one leg. You have to consider right. the triad and how you balance risk across that triad based on um, challenge that you'd face in the modernization efforts across each of those legs. We are having those discussions, sir. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for being here and for your service. Uh, uh, General Berger, I'll ask you just uh, one detailed question. I've got a few others. Hopefully, I'll have time to get to. With the uh, some of the military construction money, I think it was somewhere around $40 million affecting uh, Camp Lejeune uh, as a result of the executive order. I understand there were two projects down there that uh, have been pushed somewhat to the right. Can you give me the current status of those projects and whether or not we're in any critical timing in terms of backfilling the funding? Uh, I'm familiar with both uh, projects. Both were deferred. Um, we'll have to postpone the second radio battalion uh, building and, and the second project as well. Right now, not critical, but if they got pushed farther, then it would become a significant issue. If I could get, uh, just uh, for the record, if I could get specific dates on when that uh, really hits the critical path, I would appreciate it. Uh, yes, then uh, Secretary Spencer assured me that it wasn't uh, a challenge now, but it could be. I'd like to know the specific timing. Thank you for that. Now I've got something that... Uh, that would be for Admiral Gilday and for you, General Berger, and, 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 maybe, uh, and maybe the Secretary is the tiebreaker. And it's the, uh, the discussion we're having with FRC East, getting the funding to be best prepared for the, uh, the F-35. Um, we've got a, a bit of a stalemate there. We made some progress with the security fence with the lift fan facility, but a lot of the infrastructure is sort of Navy owned facility, Marine requirement. Every time I ask a question about who's going to actually own that and how we're going to get the funding, I get a you need to talk to the Navy or you need to talk to the Marines. Uh, do we have a definitive answer on that and where this sits on the priority list? Sir, I can say that, uh, that uh, FRC is one of, of, of our three. Uh, it is part of the optimization plan that we have, uh, and we're putting money against all three of those facilities right now. With respect to the, uh, the potential finger pointing, 
I would like to get you a deeper brief on that. The commandant and I, our staffs can come together, and if there is an issue, we will definitely resolve it. That is a, uh, that, that you, you, you answered my question before I ask it. What I'd like to do, if we could, is just in a, uh, in a meeting, if we could get the stakeholders in the room and I can get a, a definitive readout, I would appreciate that. So I have your commitment to making sure that happens. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, General Berger, you mentioned about uh, the, uh, some of the review that you're doing for the, uh, the uh, acquisition programs review. Uh, what's the current status of that? When, we sh when should we see a report out? We're done the first part of it, uh, Senator. Next uh, step is to, for me to explain the, where we stand with the chair and ranking members of the four committees here, and I'll do that this weekend next if we can get through the scheduling part of that. After that, uh, then we'll obviously go broader in terms of the, explaining the details. But I, I'm, uh, it's important that I explain to those senior leaders in Congress first what the outcomes are. So we're done the first part. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm uh, because my time is going to expire here fairly quickly, I'm going to submit uh, some questions for the record about uh, end strength, uh, a few other uh, questions that we'll just look forward to hearing back from you. In my remaining time, I'd like to talk about military housing. Uh, you know that we've spent a lot of time and effort to uh, make sure, on the one hand, we were concerned with the nearly $40 million that slid to the right. But on the other hand, we have succeeded in getting billions of dollars down to help with recovery. What's the status of that recovery? And specifically, how is the military housing situation? I'll, I'll let you know and, and everybody else that I'll be doing another town hall down there to hear directly from the military families. I think that's very helpful because for some strange reason, I announced it six weeks in advance, all the service requests tend to be done by the time I get there, but I'm hoping they're beginning to do it on a, on a more consistent basis. So if I can get an update on both those projects, recovery uh, with respect to uh, Camp Lejeune broadly and then specifically for military housing. Camp Lejeune broadly, uh, first of all, the, the town halls are, are your spot on. I mean, you, unannounced is better, and you're going to get unfiltered kind of feedback from families the way it should be, the way that the, the we want them to, uh, to be. So I thank you for that because it takes time. On the housing, there's about uh, 520, give or take, uh, empty family housing units at Camp Lejeune that the private partner uh, owns. Um, some of them uh, are repairable, some are not, and that's part of the discussion that goes on right now, the, not negotiation, but the dialogue between the department and the vendor about what to do about the 500 vacant houses. There's about 15 families, I think 15 right now, that remained in damaged homes at their choice. We, could, we offered to move them, they elected to stay there. The damage, in other words, from the hurricane was, they were okay because they're going to move anyway, so they just stayed. So we're allowed them the choice either way. The funding for the last uh, two tranches of supplementals, all of the, uh, I think, $837 million from last year put on contracts so far, I think about $157 million this year. We will be able to obligate all that you provided from, last, uh, from the, la the second tranche under, in this fiscal year. So I think by the end of the F this FY, both tranches will be fully under contract. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for your service. Um, I wanted to just pick up on a point that Senator Perdue made a few minutes ago. He, he was expressed some concern about hand-wringing over the budget and, uh, and said, you know, I wish I'd seen concerns in the past when budgets were being cut. And look, to the extent that Congress has done bad things in budgets in the past, we need to own it. Uh, my first speech as a senator in February 2013 was a speech on the floor saying, we shouldn't do the sequestering budget caps. It's a bad idea. I think the reason there's hand-wringing now is that Congress has learned our lesson, and we're trying to do good budgets for the military, and what we're seeing is the drain of billions of dollars out of the budget for a non-military emergency at the southern border. Um, here's, here's what we're doing within one year. Within the last year, the administration took first $6 billion, three and a half from MilCon and two and a half from other programs into the counter drug fund to use for the wall. So that was $6 billion out of the DOD budget. 
They've announced, the administration has now announced another $3.8 billion that's being cannibalized out of various accounts, put into the counter drug fund. So now that's $9.8 billion. And yesterday, Secretary Esper in the hearing announced that there will likely be another tranche taken from Milcon. It's been reported that would be 3.7, but just round it down, say that number's too high. It looks like the total within a year will be $13 billion, more than a billion dollars a month taken out of Congress's appropriated budget for your needs, for the nation's needs, to use for a non-military emergency that's not mentioned in the national defense strategy. Let me just put that into context. What does $13 billion mean to sea power, to our Navy and Marines? $13 billion, it's one carrier, or it's four Virginia-class subs. We're arguing about whether there should be a second sub this year. $13 billion bucks in a year is four subs. It's six destroyers. It's four amphibious assault ships. Secretary Hirono asked about the shipyard uh, industrial optimization plan. That 20-year plan is $26 billion. So the $13 billion would be half of the 20-year plan to modernize our shipyards. Or the other way to look at it is when you all submitted your budget this year, you submitted the amount of unfunded priorities you have. That total unfunded priority list for the DOD is $17 billion. $13 billion in one year taken for a non-military emergency when your total unfunded priority list is $17 billion. I'm going to say right now, if there's a Democratic president who tries to take money out of the DOD for a non-military emergency, I'm going to say, go get it through the appropriators. Don't ransack the Pentagon's budget for a non-military emergency. I stood up against Democratic or Republican presidents. If I thought they were taking us to war without coming to Congress, I'm going to stand up against a Democratic president who tries to raid the Pentagon budget for non-military emergencies. You're here saying we're trying to be focused on the national defense strategy. It's a resource-tight environment. It's sort of hard to take that at face value when we're allowing $13 billion to walk out the door for a non-military emergency in one year. I want to offer you a compliment, General Berger. You, you made, a, I think, a challenging call, but the right call recently when you announced that Confederate paraphernalia would be removed from Marine bases as of just good order and discipline. I saw that announcement, and as a Virginian with a child in the Marines, I applaud that leadership move. Secretary Modley, I want to ask you to share a story that you shared with me with all my colleagues. Secretary Modley was in the Federated States of Micronesia recently, and this is a story about U.S. and China what we're doing. Micronesia is a really important asset for us, where it is situated in the Pacific. Just share what's happening in terms of U.S. investment versus Chinese investment from your recent visit, if you would. Sir, thanks for remembering the story. Um, I was there about a year ago, and I made a trip through several Pacific islands, and I went to Micronesia and went to the far side of the island, and there was a Navy CB team there, great group. 24 CBs building a school uh, for the local citizens there. Very traditional construction, concrete pilings, corrugated steel roof, plywood sides, making great relationships with the locals. As you leave this facility and you drive down the street, there's a big sign, Micronesian Agricultural Center being paid for and built by the People's Republic of China. And it just gave me the impression that in some of these areas where we have traditional long-term friendships with these nations who want us to be their partners and we're playing small ball. We, we removed all Peace Corps volunteers from Micronesia also, in right, 2017 sir. and from Palau. Yes, sir. And that in, this, in the uh, embassy building there, I saw a bunch of signs for the old Peace Corps. And I said, why are these here? They said, well, we shut down the Peace Corps here. And they had been there since the beginning of the Peace Corps. And people in Micronesia know Americans because of the Peace Corps. So it may not extend to the entire Pacific region, but it was a, an example to me of uh, particularly how we need to step up our involvement there, and not just militarily, but in other ways. Thanks for sharing that story. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And first off, thank you, thank each of you for your service. Um, Secretary Motley, thank you for engaging with us after um, the terrorist attack in uh, Pensacola, um, trying to come up with the right um, plan to make sure 
this doesn't happen again. Um, you know, we, uh, I'll be talking on the floor today about the three individuals that lost their lives there. And, uh, and it was devastating to them, their families, but also to the, you know, that base and that community. And so, but thank you. Thank you for engaging uh, with the sheriff and, and everybody down there. The, you know, I think we, we had a hearing yesterday, Senator Ernst uh, chaired a hearing on emerging threats and capabilities uh, subcommittee. And we talked about Pensacola and what, what can we do differently? And my concern is that we are, we went right back to, to normal uh, work pretty fast. Um, we didn't, we, you know, we talked about it, 21 students got sent home for a variety of things. Um, um, and we are now uh, vetting differently. And, but are we, uh, you know, should we have a complete reset of the program uh, so we know these, we, it's not going to happen again. We've got 850 Saudi students here, and we want to build our relationship with Saudi Arabia. I talked to the Saudi ambassador, and he said the worst thing for you would be if we had another instance like this soon. I mean, I think the American public would be up in arms that you can't, you can't keep doing this. So I'm working on a proposal with, with uh, Senator Ernst that would, that would, and I'd like to get you all's feedback, but how to, how to vet the students, uh, how to get them the right kind of visa, and make sure we're not doing programs here that we could do in another country. Uh, less expensively with and with with uh, with less risk. So, what do you all think about the fact that you know we still have uh, and we have what five thousand students from around the world there? But um, my focus right now is because what happened in Pensacola is the Saudi students that that very few were actually sent back. And are we really able to do a real vetting process? The ones we still have here are we vetting their families uh, and how safe are our bases? When I was in the U.S. Navy, I never would have. Thought that there would be any risk on one uh, on the base I was on. Senator, thanks for the question. I think we're we're doing all we can. I think to step up the vetting process uh, for these students and to have a better sense for not just vetting them before they come in, but to develop some process in collaboration with those countries and to perform more continuous vetting uh, of particularly of social media or some of the things that they're doing that are. We don't doesn't require us to do anything illegal to do that. We can monitor things that are in the public sphere. We just haven't applied the resources to it, and we're looking at a very a variety of different ways that we can do that. One of the key elements, I think, also is just how to. Part of the purpose of these programs is to bring these people in and have them understand us as a nation better. And I don't think we're doing such a great job with certain countries in bringing them in, sponsoring them, having local families get getting to know them. Um, and particularly with the Saudi students, because there were so many of them, they were very insulated and, and not really a part of the broader community. And so we have to really focus on that as well. Uh, so are you gonna, do you think you'll be able to measure? Because that's what I've been told. I've been told you know, the, many of these countries, like they said, you know, if it's an Italian student, um, that everybody gets to know them and it's long-term relationships. But I have not talked to anybody in the military to date that says they have a long-term relationship with a, uh, with a Saudi, you know, somebody who was a Saudi student. Uh, they might have it. They might have it later if they're in in the, in the uh, position of leadership. But based on the, the relationship as a Saudi student, I mean, I haven't talked to anybody in the military that has one. And so, I mean, it makes you question: well, Why are we doing this um, uh, and, and and having this risk? So, um, the are you? How are you doing with dealing with the families that come? Are we vetting them, and are we continuing to vet them when they're here? I think that's all part of the process that we're doing in terms of getting a better understanding of who's coming in, what their backgrounds are, uh, and just doing it a little bit more, a little deeper uh, dive into that than we used to do. Okay. But I look forward to working with you. We, we have uh, been working with uh, Senator Ernst and some others about coming up with a better way to, uh, to do it to make sure these bases are safe. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your uh, testimony here today. Uh, General Berger, uh, you have uh, discussed the need for an appropriate balance between manned and unmanned uh, systems, including incorporating unmanned aerial combat vehicles and low-cost uh, attributable aircraft technologies uh, into the, uh, the Marine Corps. In a commentary you authored for War on the Rocks in December of 2019, you listed 11 naval expeditionary capabilities and capacities that support fleet operations which the Marine Corps is under-invested uh, in. Notably, that list started off with uh, three different types of unmanned platforms for every physical domain in, in which you fight. And I agree uh, with your assessment and know that we will need a mix of fifth-generation manned platforms like the F-35 that provide a stealth capability 
along with an array of sensors teamed with unmanned systems that can address survivability challenges and further confound uh, our adversaries' decision-making through these new technologies working together. The Marine Corps' stated requirements for the manned uh, F-35 is certainly a matter of uh, record, uh, but I have not seen your requirements for lethal unmanned uh, systems. Do you still intend to pursue a large number of lethal unmanned aerial systems per your Commandant's planning guidance and, and recent public uh, remarks? And if so, can we expect to see those desired capabilities articulated in the next Marine Corps Aviation Plan? Uh, the homework that went behind what are we going to need to fight in the future that we spoke of before that, this, that the, both the Navy and the Marine Corps have worked on for the past maybe nine, eight, nine months, drove me towards that conclusion. Will we see it in the next budget, and will we see it um, in the next AV plan, aviation plan? Um, I don't know. I think yes. But the first step is to fi first step would be to figure out how you're going to fight and then reorganize the Marine Corps for that purpose, which we have to do, which is part of the rounds that I need to make to the senior congressional leadership to explain that, that part to them. Um, then we'll, uh, I would hope that it's in the 22 and 23 budget, yes, sir. Great, thank you. Secretary Modley, the, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2020 requires you as the uh, Secretary of the Navy to, by January 31st of 23, to, and I'm quoting from the law, publish a military specification for fluorine free firefighting agent for use at all military installations and ensure that such agent is available for use by not later than October 1st of 2023. Uh, I'd like to note that although it's uh, October 1st of 2023, of course you're free to publish it before that time and would encourage you to, to do that. It's my understanding that there are large-scale commercial airports around the world that have adopted PFAS uh, free firefighting agents already. Uh, and I recognize the military context uh, is different and it's essential that we put the, the safety of our men and women uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, number one. But I'm optimistic the Navy will be able to find an a appropriate solution given what's happening around the rest of the world. Could you provide us with an update on the progress towards publishing that uh, specification and what work has been done to date uh, on that effort? I, I share your optimism on that. I think we'll, we'll figure this out. It is a world, it is a global challenge, as you mentioned, in, you know, in the United States specifically as well. All of our firefighting, uh, com uh, civilian firefighting uh, folks use this material and uh, it is a challenge for us. However, there's a lot of attention being in the scientific community looking at this. Our Office of Naval Research is looking at this and I'm, I'm confident we'll come up with an answer on this. So far we haven't um, and so particularly on our ships we're continuing to use it um, but uh, we, uh, my sense is that we're, we're, we will make progress on this and we'll get an answer. Uh, and I'm sure you're working with our allies who are also uh, uh, actually deploying some of these agents uh, uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, General Berger, last question. You know, for, the, for the defense technology and innovation uh, industrial base in this country, and the remaining seconds here, what would be your message on the technologies and capabilities to pursue and invest in that you're going to want to require for the Marine Corps of the future? Uh, first is the how part. I think we need to be better listeners than spend a year or two developing a detailed set of requirements and dump it on industry and then ask them, what do you think? That collaboration has to start from the very beginning, and it, and it is much better than it is, than it was, I'd say, five years ago. What do we need? We need to, from the individual marine to the small unit things that make them more survivable, um, more effective and lethal in a very austere environment, without the big logistics tail behind them, which has been our our challenge so far. Because we assume that that logistics tail, like the command and control the threat's going to go right after it. They're going to go after those two aspects of our warfighting capability. So it's, it's got to be tools that a Marine can use forward, can fix forward, not call a contractor, but can, he can sustain them forward, he can repair them forward, and that isn't so logistically um, burdensome that it's really difficult to keep that unit reinforced forward. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, gentlemen, it was great to see you three at the Army-Navy game. I was going to comment about the result when Senator Reid was here, but since he left, I thought I'd leave it at that. Um, General Berger, I want to compliment you on the uh, Commandant's planning guidance. I read every word of this. It's, uh, 
outstanding, innovative, bold. I, I want to thank you and your team for the exceptional work that you put into that. One topic I wanted to briefly discuss, uh, General, had, I've had good discussions this week, both in meetings and then in the hearing that the Secretary of Defense and Chairman had yesterday on the force posture that we have in the Asia Pacific, given um, the national defense strategy, including the DPRI that has been a subject of a lot of focus of the Marine Corps for, I think, two decades now. They're very focused on uh, a broader strategic look that can sustain our force posture and strategy for the next 50 to 100 years, which I think is important. You may have seen in the NDAA that was just passed 2019, uh, there's a provision that says we need to do that as well. The Secretary of Defense, Secretary or Chairman of Joint Chiefs, the Marines will be critical in that. Can you briefly comment on your thoughts on that? Uh, thanks, Senator. I, I'd share. I, I won't speak for you, but I, I, I've heard you speak before that, and I, I, I've said the same. We were postured perfectly out there for uh, another Korea in 1950, or the end of World War II, which is where that, our force That's exactly posture. right. It was an ideal posture for that, right. not ideal for uh, what the national defense strategy outlines as the major threats going forward in the Indo-Pacific. So we have to adjust it. I don't, I don't see any alternative. Well, the secretary and the chairman were very bullish on looking hard at this as well. And I know the Marine Corps has done some good work on this, and we want to help you this, I mean, not help you, but work with you. This committee has been very interested in this issue from Senator McCain to Senator Inhofe and myself, so we'll look forward to working with sure. you on that. Um, I want to turn to the Arctic. Uh, Senator Kane and I had a, a subcommittee, a readiness subcommittee hearing uh, this week. Uh, quite a good hearing. Uh, I want to compliment the Navy and the Marines on their recent Arctic expeditionary exercise out at ADAC and Seward. Difficult training, I know that uh, wasn't easy, crappy weather, but clearly uh, the Arctic has become a theater, a great power competition. Uh, I have a slide that I think some of you have seen. This is the Russian buildup in the region. Um, and it's not just forces, it's um, ports and airfields and uh, infrastructure to have force power projection. We don't really have much here. I wanna, I wanna give you a, a sense of questions here. Uh, three questions. What's the, um, and then maybe you can all, Mr. Secretary, maybe you can take this on. You know, the DOD Arctic strategy says there should be uh, FONOPS. I don't think we have the capability right now. We have two icebreakers. One's broken. The Russians have 54. Um, there's also twice now mandates to look at strategic Arctic ports, which have kind of been ignored by the Pentagon. And, uh, General, you know, uh, General Neller had some plans in addition to what was going on in the region with regard to uh, the Marines in the Arctic. Can, can the three of you just discuss these? Mr. Secretary, maybe we'll start with you. Yes, Senator, thanks. I, I just recently, within the last two weeks, had a conversation with Secretary McCarthy and Secretary Barrett about how the Navy and the uh, Army and the Air Force departments can get together to come up with a uh, a, a combined strategy in terms of basing, presence, et cetera, to address this, this Arctic challenge. And clearly uh, your, home, your, your home state will, would be critical to this in terms of where it's strategically located. And so we are developing this team now to take a look at this. And obviously once we get that assembled, we'd love to come over and talk to you about it. Good. I appreciate your initiative on that. I got your note, so thank you very much on that. Admiral, any thoughts, you know, on the FONOPS? Uh, we've talked about this before. You know, I have a, I think I've mentioned it to you in hearings, but a proud history in my family, five uncles and great uncles who served in World War II, including a, my great uncle Tom, who was a lieutenant in the Navy and did Mer three Mermanx runs. I worry that we don't have that capability right now. No ice hardened ships. Of course, this committee has authorized the purchase of six polar class icebreakers, which is a, be which is a start. But without any kind of strategic port, and we don't have anything near the Arctic. The closest thing is Anchorage. That's 1,500 nautical miles away. We can't project power, and we need to to defend our strategic interests, particularly the Navy. What's your thought on that, sir? So I, my thought on that is that I, I think that uh, if we're going to talk about 
if we're going to talk about uh, force structure, infrastructure in Alaska, I really think like DPRI, it's going to be a subset of a broader Indo-PACOM strategic laydown. So I agree with that. We're making, you know, from a joint perspective, we're making the right decisions. And then secondly, with respect to operations in the Arctic, um, ISEX right now, two U.S. submarines, one British submarine. We just in the tail end of, a, of an exercise with the Norwegians, the Navy, the Marine Corps, as well as another uh, multinational exercise ongoing. We're seeing an increasing drumbeat of operations in the high north. I think we need to continue that. I think that front ops will be important. I think that the Bering Strait will become as strategically as important as the Strait of Malacca or the or the Strait of Hormuz at some point. Putin certainly on, thinks so. Yes, sir, based on the uh, based on uh, what's going on with the ice cap. So uh, it is getting more focused, sir. I do think that taking a pause and looking at it strategically would be a would be a good move. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Motley, I want to follow up on a conversation I had with um, General Lyons of uh, Transcom last week. Uh, when discussing sea lift readiness, um, he stated that our current readiness level was lower than where it needed to be, but noted that Transcom is working to recapitalize sea lift capabilities. Um, we agreed that while sea lift is just one of the Navy's many requirements that you must balance, it is essential for Transcom to be able to do its job and help get our forces to the fight when we need it. Uh, General Lyons raised a possibility with me of using the National Defense Sea Lift Fund uh, to make progress towards our sea lift recapitalization goals, but I believe that the Navy hasn't added anything to that fund since fiscal year 2019. Um, could you please share your view on reinvigorating the National Defense Sea Lift Fund? And if you, dis if you disagree with that approach, um, what would you be your alternative approach to prioritizing recapitalization of sea lift capabilities? Senator, I... I absolutely agree that we have to recapitalize our sea lift fund this uh, or our sea lift capability um, where the funding comes from is the challenge for us and this is another one of these pressures that we have in the department of the navy particularly because we're reach we're reaching a point in history where we have to recapitalize our nuclear deterrent at the same time recover from some pretty big holes in readiness and also do this uh, which is to recapitalize our 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 sea lift so we're making choices, we're making some trades, but uh, we're gonna need some help, I think, from a budget perspective to be able to, to do it as aggressively as I think the Transcom commander would want us to do. What, what do you think about you, using the fund as an, as an avenue for, for Senator, I don't the know resources? Senator, I, I don't know that the fund has funding. Um, I, I don't know if it's similar to the strategic deterrence fund that we have as well, that is a fund that gives us some authorities, but it doesn't really have any funding attached to it. So. I'll have to get back to you on that specifically in terms of what's there or what we need to put into it. Okay, thank you. Um, I was disappointed that this year's budget baseline proposal admits key investments in sea lift and logistics that we should be prioritizing now, and we, we sort of talked about this. Um, and as you said, there's a lot of unfunded priorities, but, but the list of unfund, unfunded priorities includes tens of millions of dollars for emergency repairs to sea lift shifts um, identified by Transcom and advanced communications gear for the military sea lift command ships. Um, then in your February 18 memo, um, you, uh, uh, that kicked off the Navy's stem to stern comprehensive review, you highlighted naval logistics as an area that could be, quote, streamlined when searching for billions of dollars worth of savings. So can you help me reconcile this? How can it be a priority, but then you're talking about this is where you can cut, or am I misreading misunderstanding what you mean by uh, naval logistics would be streamlined. I mean, how do you plan to build up and sustain a growing fleet of ships without prioritizing a strong logistic network? I mean, how, how do you, who, who picks up the slack? Well, I think, Senator, I think that that particular memo went out to the entire Department of the Navy to look at every possible way that we can look at doing things better and more efficiently. I don't think anyone would argue that our uh, department from a logistics and supply chain is world class with respect to cost, distribution, the business systems that support it. We have multiple redundant business systems that, and every one of them takes a budget line every year. So we have to think about how we can do this better, more efficiently, more closely approximate some of the advances that have been made in supply chain management in the, in, in the uh, commercial sector over the years. And that's what I was talking about when I talked about logistics. Okay. Logistics demands are gonna keep going up. Mm -hmm. If we keep doing it the way we're doing it now, it's gonna cost us way too much. But we understood and agreed with that. Um, on the other hand, uh, we need to make sure that we actually 
put further investments in our logistic capabilities. Uh, and we're not talking with just, just sea lift, but also um, heavy lift aircraft. We also need to be talking about how we project fuel forward. Everything that sucks gas needs fuel. And if we're going to be um, present in the Asia Pacific region, um, then we need to be able to project into the region beyond the first 72 hours. And so that's a real concern that I have. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Thank you for your service. General Berger, let me start by saying that I really want to applaud your decision to refocus the Marine Corps on the sea denial mission. So thank you for your leadership in that area. And thank you to you and your staff for keeping Congress informed and, and on board with this as uh, you've led the Marines in this new direction. Thank you very much for that. Let's talk a little bit about Fort Leonard Wood in my home state, if we could for a second. General Admiral Gilday, Fort Leonard Wood has had the opportunity to train mil many of your uh, Marines and sailors at its engineering police and CBRN schools. Can you give us a sense of how this opportunity for joint training has benefited your respective uh, services, both from a training and resource management standpoint? Senator, not in detail, except that I, I haven't heard any problems, and so... Uh, well, that's good. But, but I cannot, uh, I, I cannot uh, comment on... Um, uh, I cannot comment on that training. Just a couple words, sir. First, uh, most Marine Corps is the smallest surface, so we don't own all our schools. Most of our Marines go to other service schools. The benefit in, in the particular case you're talking about is you're learning a trade. It's a military uh, occupation, but it's a trade. You're learning it alongside somebody you're probably going to serve with later on from another service. So the benefits are one, you do away with uh, the myths. Two, there's some standardization in how engineers operate, how military police view a problem. Because you're operating side by side, you're not in four different schools doing it. I think for us, there's an economic benefit. We can't afford our own school. Two, the standardization thing is, is great. And three, they, they actually, it may be the only time, but if not, it's the first time they're going to operate alongside somebody from another service. So it does it tamps down all the myths about them. Very good. Thank you for that. We're obviously very proud of Fort Leonard Wood and the work that they do there. I'm glad that they're serving you well. General, uh, back to uh, a sea denial. Can you give us an update on your rogue fires and ground-based anti-ship missile programs in terms of where they are now and um, their timelines for fielding? Both of the capabilities you speak of have in war, in war games and in simulation have proven if uh, game changer is probably an over the top characterization, but it definitely changes the calculus of an adversary. Because right now that capability is something we don't have, and it posed with that, they have to act differently. Rogue fires, in particular, on a great glide path. We are investing in it. Do I? Do, you know, who knows if that's a solution ten years from now? But we are going down that path right now. Ground launch cruise missiles and everything long range precision fires that's in a small enough um, format that a small marine unit can embark it, can use it, we're after it, yes. Very good. From an ISR and C2 standpoint, what would you say, General, are the most important programs for ensuring that Marine Corps fire units have the targeting data they need to perform the sea denial mission? Some will say, and I think there's a logic to that, that they're kind of agnostic. I don't care where I get my fire, fire data solution from or what ISR platform, I just need the data. Then there's truth in that. On the other hand, we need organic naval ISR so that that expeditionary naval force that's operating in uh, either in UCOM or in the first island chain or wherever has the means to pick up the targets forward in an expeditionary manner. And they got to be able to launch and recover from naval platforms from shore, and they got to be small enough if they're going to be embarked with us that we can sustain them. Right now, we've used uh, MQ-9s for the last year and a half in southwest, uh, in Helmand province in Afghanistan as a learning platform for us. How to close that kill chain organically. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Modley, Admiral Gilday, come back to you. Admiral Davidson recently testified that about half of his attack submarine requirement, only half, is being met in the Indo-Pacific, and a problem that he forecasts will worsen in the 2020s as our attack submarines that retire faster than they're being replaced. Uh, talk to us about this. How's the Navy planning to, in to mitigate the uh, anticipated shortfall here in uh, the Indo-Pacific in particular? Senator, we're buying submarines at the rate uh, that both Electric Boat and Huntington Ingalls can produce them. So we are buying at, at the maximum output uh, right now with the exception of the fact that 
uh, one submarine drop in the budget in, in, in 21. It really comes down to uh, ruthless prioritization. So we are meeting the Secretary of Defense's direction for the numbers of ready submarines to get to sea, and we've been doing that. And then it really comes down to prioritization between, principally between Russia and China in terms of how those submarines are then allocated across the combatant commanders and employees. Let me just ask you finally, Mr. Chairman, uh, aside from, from growing that uh, the submarine force, are there other investments that are needed to extend our undersea warfare advantage? Unmanned. And so we are, we are making great gains in uh, unmanned under the sea. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Senator Hawley. And uh, thank all three of you for the, the time you spent with this excellent testimony. We're adjourned. Thank you.